Hey, in this video, I'd like to share with you seven, seven, <laughs> seven Bible verses which I feel are usually take note of context. These are my top seven, but if you have any that I do not put in this list, you can post in the chat and tell me which ones you like to, to add. I posted on my Facebook page this question and I got a lot of feedback. I took some of the Bible verses from there, but there are some in this video that, that I did not see anyone posted. So welcome. I'm Damian Chambers and this is your Devotional Digest. If you haven't yet done so, please consider to subscribe to this channel. First up on the list is Joel chapter 2 and verse 13. It says, Rend your heart and not your garment. Most persons usually quote this scripture to say, Render your heart and not your garment, meaning that you must don't focus on what you wear to church, but focus on the condition of your heart. While that is a good message, that's not what the scripture is saying. This text is found within the context of the practice or custom of mourning among the Jews. Usually when a person is lamenting a great distressful situation, whether the death of a loved one, a great loss or something, they would tear their garment or rend their garment and throw um, ashes upon their head as an out, outward sign that they are mourning something great. For example, you have when Judah heard that Joseph was sold into slavery, he mourned. When, when Jacob heard that Joseph was killed, he started to mourn by tearing his garment and throwing ashes upon his head. And also Job did a similar thing when he heard about the great loss that he had suffered of his property. This practice also was connected with spirituality to demonstrate repentance and mourning over evil and in the book of Joel Joel was calling for great repentance because of the destruction that was impending upon Israel and so he was calling the people to repentance and saying to them listen when you come to mourn don't just tear your garment at the outward show don't be a hypocrite rend your heart let your heart also experience a repentance and not just your outward garment that is the message of Joel chapter 2 and verse 13 when it's placed in its proper context. Second up on the list is Acts chapter 10 and verse 13. It says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Persons often use this passage to mean that God is saying that no animal is beyond the boundaries of consumption. You can eat any animal. No, no animal is clean or unclean anymore based on the New Testament or based upon this command. But this is not so. The context of the passage shows that it was a dream that the apostle had that God gave him to teach him a lesson. In this dream, Peter saw a sheet coming down out of heaven with all types of animals in that sheet. And God said to Peter, Peter, rise, kill and eat. And Peter protested. Peter said, listen, Lord, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And God said to him, what God has cleansed, do not call common or unclean. But God was not talking about the meat. Peter stated clearly what God was talking about and what the dream actually meant. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 28, the Bible says, And he said unto them, You know how that it, has, it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God had showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. This vision came right upon the heels of when God would send someone from a Gentile house, a Roman centurion called Cornelius, whom God was working to convert. And God wanted Peter to do that work. But God knew the practice of the Jews that they felt that the Gentiles were unclean we should not dwell with them and so God gave him that vision to illustrate that the Gentiles cannot receive the gospel and the Gentiles are part of the commonwealth of Israel next upon the list is first Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 persons often quoted to say 
money is the root of all evil. Well, actually, not only did the scripture not say that, but it is, a, it is taken out of context. The scripture says that the love of money is the root of all evil. The context of the passage is that the apostle was urging the brethren to be content in whatsoever state they are. Whether they have abundance or whether they have little, they must remain faithful to God and not allow the pursuit of wealth to draw away them away from the faith. Because he said the love of money is the root of all evil. If you love money more than God, it's going to produce all manner of evil. Jesus hinted at something similar in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 when he says, You cannot serve God and mammon. And the conclusion of that sermon Jesus gave was that you must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So God is not saying that you must not be concerned about money or that you don't need money. God is saying don't allow money to be first priority because God is going to take care of those aspects of your lives as you take care of his kingdom. So before I continue, let me ask you, do you have any that you would like to add to this list? Post in the chat below any Bible verse that you feel persons take out of context. And also, I would like to hear your thoughts on the ones that I'm commenting on. Fourth on the list is Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, a very famous one. It says, judge not that ye be not judged. Persons often use this text when they are being corrected by a brother or a sister. They say, judge not that ye be not judged. But the text is not condemning the practice of correcting people because within the same Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told us that if we know, if we and a brother have fault, we must first go and tell him his fault by himself. So what the text is speaking to is a matter of judging motive or judging a matter before we know the full essence of it. And that feels, you know, if, if you've ever been in that situation before, it feels, it feels, uh, it feels, it, it doesn't feel good. It's not a good feeling when people come to conclusion about a situation before they hear all the facts. And that is what judging is. Judging has to do with judging the motive. But we are asked in the same passage to be fruit inspectors. It says, if how are you going to know a false prophet? By their fruits, you shall know them. In other words, by their actions. You must be able to look at people's actions and see whether or not they are a true prophet of God. So there, there comes a time when the Christian must um, judge. In, the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, the Apostle Paul referred to the same thing. That, listen, you don't need to go to the court to judge a matter between brother and brother. You have people among you who can judge a situation. So this passage is not saying that we must not correct each other. The passage is saying when you are correcting or when you are making conclusions, make sure you have all the facts. Another interesting passage that is usually to take note of context is Jeremiah chapter 21 verse 11 that says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans of peace and not of evil. Now, this one is not so bad, but I really added it to the list because I want to fix the context for us to get a better idea of what the passage is saying. Most persons usually use this passage to say or to mean that God has great plans for your life and the, the plans that he has ahead of you are, are wonderful and great. Which is true. <laughs> it's always true. But it, but it helps to get the full context of this passage. In, in Jeremiah chapter 29, Jeremiah was speaking to Jews who were either going into exile or would have been in exile already. You see, what happened is that God was asking Jeremiah to tell the people of Judah to submit to a heathen king of Babylon. You know the story of the Jews who were in their, in their land as God promised them. But because of disobedience, God was punishing them by placing them into subjection to this heathen king. It was part of a pruning process. And so he was saying to them, go to Babylon. Nothing is going to happen to you because the plans I have for you are plans of peace and not of evil. It is okay. You can submit to Nebuchadnezzar. It's part of my plan. So I would I'd rather use this passage in terms of application in situations where I do not fully understand what the future holds. I may be facing difficulty, 
but I must still believe that the plans that God has for me are plans of peace and not of evil. One of my favorite on the list, and which was not on my Facebook page, I didn't say the one posted this one, is Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. It says, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Persons often use this passage to mean that we must be as sinless and spotless as the Father, and we must feel bad until we get to that point. Now, while sinlessness is a noble aspiration and it is something that ultimately we will all accomplish by the grace of God, the Bible speaks about God, Jesus, presenting us, presenting us without spot or without wrinkle. That is, I, I don't disagree with that. But the full context of the passage tells me that that is not exactly what Jesus is talking about. The context of the passage is that Jesus is speaking to the spirituality of the law or the, the, the correct approach to obedience to the law. It's not just a matter of outward correctness. Matter of fact, the Pharisees themselves, whom Jesus was speaking against, quote unquote, they themselves were, 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 were obsessed with perfection. They were obsessed with, with being so perfect that they would measure the distance that you can walk on the Sabbath. And if you go beyond that, you're considered to be sinning. They were obsessed with perfection. But Jesus is saying, no, the, the true motive of the law, the true purpose of the law is to get the heart right. So while you may not commit adultery outwardly with a woman, but if you, in your heart, you are lusting after her, you're guilty of adultery. While you may not take up a knife and stab and kill, your brother or the Romans who you hate so much, but if you cherish hatred and bitterness in your heart against them, you are guilty of murder. So Jesus is saying, be therefore perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Love your enemies because your father is merciful to the evil as well as to the good. So be perfect like him, love your enemies like him. Do good to them who hate you and, and pray for them that despitefully use and persecute you. What difference does it make? The difference is that when, you're, when your aim is sinless perfection, you're going to be like the Pharisees. You're going to come before God and say, God, you know, I didn't commit any sin today. I, I, did, all, I did everything right. So here am I. I'm so good. But when the focus is on the spirit of the law, you will continually recognize how incapable you are of truly fulfilling the law without the Spirit of Christ. So more and more you'll see the Spirit of God to be in you, to empower you to do what is right. The final one on the list is really my favorite. And that is number seven, Philippians chapter four and verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Persons often use this passage to mean that I can do anything I want to do, anything I put my mind to, I'm able to do it. If, if I have an exam to do, you know, I can put my mind to it and I can do all things. I can pass that exam. But that's not really what the passage is saying. The context of the passage, again, speaks to the matter of contentment and the ability to, be, to remain faithful to God under all circumstances. In this context, the apostle was talking about the Philippians brethren, how they were so gracious to him and they were so kind to him. And then Paul said, really, I am not making that point to really pull on your sympathy. I am making that point to, to thank you and to affirm in what you're doing. But really, for me, I have learned that in whatever state I am, to be content. That's what, the Paul, that's what Paul was saying. I have learned that if I'm, if I'm hungry, I'm going to be faithful to God. If I, am, if I am full, I am going to be faithful to God. I have learned in whatsoever state I am, very to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can, I can endure all things. I can, I can be faithful under all circumstances. That's what the passage is really saying. So there you have it. Seven Bible verses that I usually take note of context. Again, as I'm saying to you, taking note of context can be very dangerous and also it, it causes the text to lose its true meaning and, and the, the impact 
that it should really have on your life. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe so that you can keep up to date on videos that we post on this channel. God bless you.